Hi guys, Mr. Off Waffles here. This is the complete story of the machine, as told through its Easter egg, spectral reflections, boss fight, Easter egg end cutscene, and further secrets found throughout the map. The gameplay is recorded at absolute max settings, so that's 4K, 60 FPS, all real time ray tracing settings turned on, high quality texture pack installed, Nvidia DLSS turned on and set to quality, and Nvidia Reflex boosting my system performance even further. This was only possible thanks to my sponsors, Nvidia and Scan Computers, who teamed up to build me an insane system containing a new RTX 3090, so massive thank you goes out to them. And if you want to build a similar 3XS system for yourself, like the one that I've got, there's a link in the description down below for you to do that. For now though, let's see what this beast of a system is capable of with the full story in 4K of D Machine. Let's start at the beginning with the map's intro cutscene. Did you get the package? We've lost two teams since you went dark. Old war footage is the last thing on my mind right now. Watch it. Watch the tape. Then tell me I'm wrong. How did you get hold of this? A friend in the KGB. A late friend. Germans have Russian friends? Yeah, some of us do. What the hell is that? That is why you needed to see the tape. The machine. shot one week later. It's a cleanup crew. Poor bastards. Tried to bury it. On that stayed buried until two weeks ago. Now it's happening again. Have you heard of the Omega? You have to turn yourself in. The CIA can protect you. I can protect you. I can't do that, Weaver. The Omega Group have plans for the outbreak zones. I have to stay in the field. Sam, please. I'm sorry. This is the only way. Here we begin to learn about the different factions involved in the new Cold War Zombies storyline. On one side, we have Requiem, the most secretive department of the CIA, and on the other, Omega, a KGB Spetsnaz outfit seeking to harness the energies of the Dark Aether to give the USSR a strategic advantage over their American adversaries and win the Cold War. Working for the CIA is one Grigory Weaver, who you may remember lost his eye to Lev Kravchenko back in 1963. Twenty years later, Weaver has now been moved from his old post to a new one, 
head of field operations within Requiem. He is asked to put together a list of operatives to send into Morasco to investigate the site that Samantha has pointed him towards with her note and this videotape. And that is where you, the player, step into the picture. There are a few other key members of the Requiem team who it would be worth introducing you to. Dr. Gray, Dr. Strauss, and Major Carver. We'll start with Gray. <coughs> Strike team, you there? Of course you are. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit new to all this. Hopefully you don't mind the less than formal approach. Should probably introduce myself. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Gray, head of unnatural sciences. And well, this is about as unnatural a Sunday as I can remember. <laughs> I mean, normally about now I'd be sitting in my lab in Bristol having a good natter with Pip and Sam, two McCorks I work with, over a nice cup of tea. Then just bam! This whole thing happens. Next thing I know, I'm drafted by the bloody government to be the representative in this new organization, Requiem. I mean, how could I pass that up? Clearly, Gray is excited by the scientific possibilities coming with her new position as head of unnatural sciences at Requiem. Similar can be said for Strauss, head of Requiem's energy research division, although his past is much more complicated. I know you have your suspicions about me. I hear what your type says about me in the halls. Mein God, is that Dr. Oscar Strauss, former Nazi scientist? They put him in charge of energy research? It is so horrible. <laughs> Strauss actually used to work at the D-Machine facility some 40 years ago. And as such, you'll notice that he actually recognizes some aspects of the building and its surrounding area. However, Things have changed a lot since he was last there. Finally, the bull to these two scientists' china shop is the one and only Major Carver. Strike team, do you read me? <sighs> Finally, strong signal. I know the circumstances are less than ideal, but allow me to formally introduce myself. I am Major Mackenzie Carver. My friends call me Mac. You will not. And yes, I am that Major Carver. Most likely all the stories you've heard are true. But that is in the past. I'm a firm believer in living in the now and preparing for the future. As you may well know, I head up Requiem's Containment and Security Division. It's a post I personally requested. Make no mistake, we are at war. This is chess. And the Soviet's Omega Group? <laughs> they just moved their queen into position. Where the scientists are driven by curiosity, and wanting to do science, Carver is driven by his duty to his country and simply wants to get the job done. He's committed to making sure that America does not fall behind in the Cold War. And that all starts with keeping up with Omega. With those key players introduced, we can start to explore the facility. Here we are, ground zero. Dimensional gates opening around the world. Should have known it would come back to some evil Nazi experiment gone wrong. Wouldn't be the first time, would it, Major Carver? Team, facility entrance should be just ahead. Looks like Omega Group was correct. They came here and decided to pick up where the Nazis left off. As Weaver says, the Germans built the cyclotron during World War II, and they referred to the operation as Project End Station. Its goal was to further the German nuclear weapons program, known as Uranverein, and it was all overseen by a new, important character called Dr. Ulrich Vogel. Let's take a moment to explore the story of how the cyclotron accident occurred in the first place and what Vogel was doing at Project End Station. In the early 1940s, Vogel's proposal to build the cyclotron was approved, and he was tasked with overseeing its construction alongside an assistant, Dr. Kurtz. They did exactly that, but then in 1944, Vogel was approached by Kurtz and warned that an upcoming cyclotron test may be unstable. However, due to pressure from the Third Reich to make dramatic advances in uranium enrichment efforts, Vogel told Kurtz that they had to push on regardless. Anomaly detected. Dr. Vogel, the upgrades are completed. We are ready for the test. But I ran the numbers again. Yeah, yeah, you are still worried we could have a containment failure. Keeping the dimensional barrier open that long will redline every system in the cyclotron. I, I cannot promise she will hold together. Kurtz, do you pay any attention to reports from the Eastern Front? We do this now, before the Red Army arrives. 
But we do not do it at all. Of course, of course. I just thought we should go into this with our eyes open. Understood, my dear Kurtz. But if we can change the course of the war, any risk is worth taking. This insistence on pushing forward would prove to cause serious problems, as can be heard in a recording taken on the day of that test. I have completed my adjustments, Dr. Fogler. You may begin recording. Thank you, I already have. This is Ulrich Vogel, director of Project N Station. 7th of March, 1944, 10.03 p.m. Commencing cyclotron test run number 12. Dr. Kurtz, please proceed. All readings are within acceptable parameters. Looks like we are getting the collisions we expected and, um, some interesting patterns are starting to... What was that? I, I, I do not know. Gages are redlining. We have to shut down. My God. What is happening to the air around the collider? You men, back away from that! Kurt, cut the power! I'm trying, controls are not responding! Despite the severity of this incident, Vogel did not see it as a failure, and he actually talked about it in another audio recording a few days later. Ulrich Vogel, director of Project N Station, 12th of March, 1944. Five days have passed since the accident, I am starting to see it not as a setback, but a breakthrough, literally. The cyclotron continues to operate, apparently without an external power source. We cannot deactivate it, and it is still manifesting the strange phenomenon I call a rift, and Kurtz calls a wormhole. The attached instruments to the end of a long metal pole and passed it through the rift. The readings confirm that somehow the cyclotron ripped through the fabric of space-time. Something lies on the other side. A parallel world, or perhaps a whole universe. But we dare not approach too closely, lest we suffer the same fate as the men currently held in our medical clinic. Those men remain in a state best described as living death. Kurt thinks they caught a high dose of some exotic radiation from the other side of the rift. We are checking their blood and tissue samples for traces of rare elements or otherworldly pathogens. This actually tells us the origin of the anomalies. It was that test that went wrong on that fateful day. Later in the year, control of the situation was lost to the extent that the Germans actually had to flee the facility, and one of the only people left behind was an unlucky soldier called Walter. Hello! Scheiße! The monsters, they are everywhere. I am surrounded. My men, they are all gone, and all that remains. The station has fallen. That scientist, he knew something. First he flees during the transport, then the radiation leak, now the undead are everywhere. That sucks, that swine! He knew this would happen. He left us for dead. Breathe, water. It will be fine. They will send reinforcements, they have to. So until then, I will... I will, I will hide, yeah. That's right, I will hide, and I will evade. The weapon that Walter took with him into the storage closet was the decompressive isotopic estrangement device, and while it was exceedingly effective at taking down the undead, help never came for him and as such, he died there, hiding in the closet with the device in his arms. Let's jump back to the present day now and follow the progress of the strike team for a bit as they move through the map, uncovering the remains of some of these past events. Soviets sealed this place up in the 40s. Why unseal it? We should turn the power on. Power restored. Beginning cyclotron reactivation. Warning. Energy stabilization required. Energy stabilization at 50%. <laughs> Energy stabilization at 100%. Stabilization restored. Anomaly generated. Activating power was pretty straightforward for the strike team, but doing so spawned in a dimensional anomaly. I think it's fair to say that's what a mega group was investigating. Son of a bitch. It looks 
just like the others we've seen. Germans must have breached it during the war. They were desperate at the end. We lost our signal. We're gone. Strike team, are you there? Can you hear me? Strike team, report. What the hell just happened? If I'm reading this right, I think Strike Team crossed the threshold into another dimension. This back and forth transport into the Dark Aether is really the backbone of this map's story. Upon travelling into the Dark Aether a second time, the Strike Team found parts of a mysterious device used by the Germans before they fled the facility. Looks like our Strike Team found part of a device. Any idea what it is? When they finished crafting it, they discovered it was an ether scope, a mechanism used to view apparitions and spectral reflections stuck in space and time between the dark ether and our normal world. As this happened, a new order came in from the director of the CIA. It's our lucky day, Strike Team. We have new orders from the director. We are to shut down the dimensional breach in an effort to contain the spread. Suggestions? I say we shut down the cyclotron. Severing the dimensional connection is our best chance to contain the spread. This was not the first time that a plan had been formed to shut down the cyclotron. Back in the 40s, after the Germans abandoned Project End Station, the Russians arrived to come and clean up the mess. This was actually shown to us in Samantha's original VHS tape, with the facility being sealed off from the outside world to prevent any accidents like the ones that the Germans had created from happening again in the future. But before they closed the doors, one last man had to step inside to shut down the cyclotron, and his name was Kazimir Zykov. Здравствуйте. My name is Pavel Lazarev. I was sent to contain this mess, and you're going to help. Comrade, state your name. Kazimir Zykov, Starshina, First Guards Tank Army. I, uh, I hear mechanic. I was told despite your limited education, you understand German equipment. Well, I scavenge parts from Panzer tanks to keep our T-34s running. How can I be of service, Comrade Lazarev? There is a machine I need you to deactivate. It is called a cyclotron. It leaks strange radiation. You have seen what it does to men. Da, Colonel. What if same thing happens to me? You will not fail, Zikov. You may not survive, but you will not fail. Understood? Da. Casimir's job was not an easy one, and he knew it would be the death of him. But still, he did it for his country, Mother Russia, and he even wrote to his wife to tell her that he had to go on with this, but he still did love her. My dearest Raisa, it is me, your Casimir. I am sorry to break my promise. But I will not be coming home to you. I have orders to turn off the German machine. Diesel engines, I, I understand. Radios I can't fix, but this. And the things down here try to kill me. Perhaps they already have. But not before. I finish my mission. I cut off the power, but still the machine run. And I swear, sometimes I... I hear it call my name. I am going to try one more thing. If the dead will let me. I have tools, but not many bullets. That swollen scurvy who ordered me down here. I do not do this for him. I do this for the world. For Mother Russia. I do this for you, Raisa. My love for you will never die. To complete his task, Casimir tried to do everything he could. He cut every cable he could find. He corrupted the cyclotron's fuel by pouring sugar into a gas tank. And he attempted to ground and short circuit the machine. Still though, it continued to run, and so he was forced to give his life to carry out one final idea he had to shut it down for good. His work was noble, and it prevented calamity and death from spreading across the globe for many years. All this time later, 
it will hopefully be clear to you now that the strike team's task of shutting down the cyclotron wouldn't be an easy one. To get started, they realized that they needed to interface with a computer in the viewing area of the medbay. A mysterious canister was mounted in the center of the room, hanging from the ceiling, and blueprints nearby referred to it as Der Wessler. To find the password needed for the computer, the team used the etherscope that they just crafted to explore spectral reflections left behind by Dr. Vogel, detailing some of his experiments that he carried out before he fled Project N Station. Ulrich Vogel, director of Project N Station, 19th of March 1944. Dr. Kurtz and I continue our study of the men so grotesquely transformed by the cyclotron accident. We have confirmed an exotic element contaminated their bodies, necrotizing the flesh and shutting down essential metabolic functions while somehow maintaining a semblance of life in them. Our hope is to modify a radiation scrubber and heal the poor wretches, but they will not be willing patients, so we will need a chamber of sorts. This may take some time. Vogel, 3rd of April, 1944. After a great deal of trial and error, the decontamination chamber is complete. Kurtz, unfortunately, referred to it as Der Wechsler, and I'm afraid the nickname stuck. <sighs> to be clear, we are not trying to change these men so much as restore them. But the initial results are encouraging, slightly. Removing exo-elemental contamination from their brains improved some higher functions and reduced their violent outbursts. But these men are far from restored. Medical trials will continue. Ulrich Vogel, PhD, 22nd of August, 1944. It took losing Normandy to finally get the Fuhrer's attention. <laughs> Now, at last, he wants to weaponize our findings here at End Station. It was an idea that occurred to me the moment I first conceived of the Wechsler. If we can restore the minds of our necrotized soldiers, even just to follow simple commands, we could unleash an undead army on both fronts. Just imagine each brave German who falls in battle rising back up to protect the fatherland. It gives me joy to picture the enemy running in terror from men who cannot die. Der Wechsler translates to the Changer, and it's clear that Vogel wanted to try and use it to weaponize the undead, restoring their minds so they knew that they were on Team Germany, and thus ensuring that the German army's numbers would never dwindle, no matter what happened. It would be much easier, after all, to win the war if you had an army of soldiers that could never die. The chamber in the medbay was used to try and do exactly this. It was attempting to decontaminate the undead specimens and restore their consciousness, cleansing them of their undead inhibitions, which were much more random, and allowing them to keep fighting for Germany. Once the strike team found Vogel's password, which was AHV, the chamber turned on, but it required power, which was provided by firing the experimental wonder weapon, known as the die, at four capacitors on the corners of the chamber. To find this weapon, the strike team had to break into Walter's final resting place, and pry the gun from his skeleton. When they did this, Carver radioed in to say that he'd actually heard of this weapon before. With the die upgraded all four times so that each capacitor could be charged, the etherscope once again showed the strike team an echo of events that took place in the history of the facility. This time, the focus is on Dmitriev and Kalashnik, two members of the Russian 8th Guards who arrived at End Station a week after it was abandoned by the Germans. While they were stationed there, they noticed a gold ball in a storage case in the medbay, and on a night when the facility was quiet because the other members of their team were out in the town, they made a plan to steal it. Are you certain no one saw us come down here? Well, the Rev and these people have gone into Poznan. Just make sure no one else approaches. First, no one knows we helped ourselves to whatever this is. You know perfectly well what it is. Gold. Enough for both of us to buy a nice dacha in the country. I do not know why they need a gold for a big fish tank, but at least this is to take out. That is no aquarium, Kalashnik. Look more like a gas chamber. <laughs> Fucking Nazis. 
whole place stinks of death, Dmitriev. But you and I will be rich long after a bad smell fades away. With the ball out of the case, they decided to hide it in a tree to make sure no one would find it while they were going about their duties, winning the war and all that stuff. And so they planned to return for it later. Let Colonel Lazarev worry about that. You just remember which tree, okay? Stay safe up there. Uncle Vadim and Uncle Alexei will come for you just as soon as Berlin is in flames. Once the strike team saw this apparition showing them where the ball had been hidden, they realized that they would need something to knock it down from the tree. And to do this, they had to find a way to fire the tank in the spawn area of the map. A wrench was found that appeared to have been crafted from the energy of the Dark Aether itself, very mysterious stuff, and they used this to bonk on the tank until it woke up the driver, who was now undead, who was still inside. Through a little persuasion and one or two explosives, they convinced the driver to fire the tank, and sure enough, it knocked the ball out of the tree. The team simply then ran over to it, grabbed it, and escorted it back to its original location in the medbay. The last remaining thing that it seemed like they had to do was to find a subject to suck into the chamber. Two halves of a split megaton seemed like the perfect choice. They were both led into the machine, and once turned on, it fused them back together, revealing a new key character in the story of this map, Orlov. Proceed to observation room to commence primary function. Commencing primary function. Decontamination in progress. Having broken free, Orlov ran off into the dark, but Carver had a suggestion. You could lure him out somehow. We're sure as shit not gonna find him in the darkness. Options? Sounds like you need some bait. A metaphorical worm to lure that oversized fish. Before we talk about the strike team's efforts to do that though, let's take a second to quickly try and understand Orlov a little better. Orlov is a lieutenant within Omega Group, which might at first make it sound like he's on the team of the bad guys and as such he shouldn't be trusted. However, I don't think it's that simple. You see, the Cold War was very much a war of ideology, and while you may more align with the American side than the Russian side, or the West versus the East, both sides weren't innocent in their goal to endlessly better the other and come out on top as this superior global force. Throughout our time playing D-Machine, we hear Weaver and Carver discussing the implications of Omega's actions and how they must be stopped at all costs to prevent further dimensional breaches all over the world, but I'm sure on the USSR's side of things, they were just as scared about what Requiem could potentially be doing. I mean, Requiem have created all these crazy field upgrades that we use in the map, and that's technology that if the USSR didn't have a counterpart to sort of meet it with in the field, they would be completely bested by. So when you consider things from Omega's point of view, it doesn't look so completely and obviously evil. And this is even more true, I think, when you consider low-level members of Omega, because they simply want to do what they can to help their country that they love so much and help the USSR. I hope you are ready. What I am ready for is to perform my duty as a You do not have to sound so cold. You see these footsteps we take? This is a step into history. When we restart the machine, a new chapter for Mother Russia begins. All thanks to us. We will be remembered as heroes, you and I. Do you not agree? Do you know what will happen when we turn on that machine? Did they tell you anything? They told me it was first step towards Soviet supremacy. So they did not tell you either. What more do you want? We were told enough. Come, 
We must complete our job. Which will you be, or not? Will you be remembered the hero or coward? A hero indeed. I hope. It's clear, I think, from this that pride for their country motivated these two men, Orlov and Medvedev, despite the fact that they were volunteered for this not by their own volition, but almost against their will. Unfortunately, Orlov's hesitations were actually really justified as the higher-ups within Omega didn't necessarily have his best interests in mind. Anomaly detected. Just think, Dr. Beck. In two days, we will forge a new future for the Soviet Union. So, I take it you found your men? I found two volunteers for the task. <laughs> you find that amusing? No. More ironic, actually. In 1945, the Red Army volunteered a man's life to shut it down. Forty years later, here we are, volunteering men to reactivate it. It's almost poetic. Guess you can't teach an old Soviet new tricks. I am not interested in tricks, Beck. I am interested in results. If my calculations are correct... If your calculations are correct, we will have immediately achieved more than those Nazi bastards ever did. And rest assured, they are correct. Let's hope so. The Colonel doesn't want to suffer fools gladly. Test data suggested that a dimensional breach would reoccur immediately once the accelerator was reactivated, but Orlov and Medvedev were not informed of this. The breach would cause widespread infection, and Omega knew too that the resulting chances of further dimensional breaches worldwide was very high. Still, as it was seen as an opportunity to get ahead of the West in this never-ending race, it was decided that there was no choice about things. Orlov and Medvedev had to go in and turn the accelerator back on, and that's exactly why this Requiem strike team had to then come in afterwards and try and clean up the mess. As Carver suggested, the team had to look for bait to lure Orlov out at this point, and they decided on a picture of his wife and daughter to do the task. When they found the picture and picked it up, they were shown another spectral reflection of Orlov's last time looking at the photo before he was sent to complete his mission. Anomaly detected. My son, you look at him. I know you cannot hear me, but I must ask you. Give me strength. Omega Group has given me my orders. I am to restart that infernal machine. In this, I have no say. It is my duty. When it is reactivated, I do not know what will happen. That information is considered very much above my rank, but considering the precautions the others not take, I must face the possibility that I may never see you again. I hope this is not true. I hope that nothing will change, that the world will stay as it is. But I fear I am opening a box that cannot be closed. I will see you both again. Damage I have done. 
The bait was secured and successful, with Orlov being lured out of his hiding place in the darkness of the particle accelerator room. Emotional about how he had been double-crossed, Orlov vowed to help the team deactivate the accelerator by turning off various fail-safes that had been installed in it. Hydro infusion exceeding speed parameters. Access to the shutdown protocol Alpha 1. Give them back. Zombies, megatons, plague hounds, and megaton overlords all flooded into the room, fighting tooth and nail to take down the team and prevent all of from closing the dimensional breach. But they were matched by the team's coordination and firepower. Warning. It is finished. You must go now. Mm. If someday you meet my Sonia and Katya, tell them I will see them both again. Go now. That's all I need to hear. Raptor 1 is inbound, strike team. Get the hell out of there. Commence facility evacuation. You have 90 seconds to reach minimum safe distance. With the accelerator shutdown underway, the last remaining task for the team was to escape on Raptor 1, which was flying in to pick them up as fast as it could. Raptor 1 at the LZ, Requiem Actual. As Weaver said, he feared that Omega was just getting started, and while this dimensional breach was closed now, there were others around the world that would need to be dealt with. The exact movement and plans of Omega were still unknown at this point, but intelligence suggested that further breaches in both the Ural Mountains in Russia and in Vietnam would be next on the priority list. With that, the team flew away, their task seemingly completed for now. This has been the complete story of D-Machine. If you want to see more story content like this from me, please consider subscribing, click the little bell and turn on notifications, and if you could like the video, that would be amazing as well. It's taken a huge amount of time to put this together, and I really hope it was worth it. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time, bye for now.